everybody. Uh, welcome back to another episode of Bob and Chad, uh, Speed Dips by Bob and Chad. Uh, it seems like it's been a long time since we talked with you guys. Um, I, I kept thinking we were going to go in a week and then pretty soon, well, no, it's another week yet. And another week yet. I'm thinking, boy, all of a sudden it's like the 19th, trying to be in the Christmas spirit here. Um, well, I'm always in the Christmas spirit. It just depends on the situations. I, I do have this one little sign that I keep on my desk that, you know, it says I don't need anger management. I just need to have people stop pissing me off. So, I mean, I'm in the Christmas spirit all the time. But anyway, uh, hi, Chad. How's things going with Chad? Oh, we're doing pretty good. Full-blown winter time here. Yes. I we got predicted for Wednesday and Thursday, like six to nine inches of snow, 50 mile an hour winds. Friday supposed to be a negative four degrees. I'm like, man, I was actually looking up flights for Phoenix. <laughs> yeah, there's got to be some trackside we can do, right? I'm thinking, God, yeah, there's got to be something down there we could do. No doubt about that. I mean, the tracks are sitting there. We just have to show up and have have a show from there. We just had, we went to the dome. That was nice. That was inside. The weather was good, but still nice to be inside. That was a, that was a heck of an event. Uh, man, if you haven't been to that deal, the racing at St. Louis inside the dome, uh, you got to put it on your list of things to do. It's literally like flying fighter jets in a gymnasium. It's such a unbelievable atmosphere and, uh, it's such a good time. We had a great turnout, had a lot of our customers there. We had booths set up in the garage area and up on the concourse. So it was a, it was an awesome event and an awesome week. I had another customer of mine that, or somebody, I don't remember now who it was, that talked about the fact that I've never been there. So it's, it's an event that I haven't, haven't ventured out to. And, and, uh, um, they said the same thing that it's just uh, you, you, you can't this it's not anything that you can explain to anybody it's it's kind of like you know daytona i mean until you've actually been to daytona you can't grasp or grasp how how fast those cars what 200 mile an hour really actually is yeah. and uh, so you know it's definitely something i'm going to have to do here in the next couple of years for sure I'll just go down there with my Weir's shirt and, and hang out in, in the Weir's booth. Hey, I, I'm always looking for factory reps. I'll hire you for the weekend. Well, I got my shirts, so I've got one step ahead. I mean, I'm working in that direction. Uh, Scott says, good evening and Merry Christmas. I appreciate that, Scott. Same to you and your family. Aaron, what's better, pros and cons? 102 wheelbase static or 108 for a pro stock three-link car? You know, I myself am not that great on some of the shorter wheelbase stuff. Uh, you know, my experience, of course, is definitely much more with the 108 stuff. Um, you know, there was kind of a little bit of a transition from when we went to 110 to 108, that, that those cars were a little bit quicker and a little more responsive. And... Um, I, I don't know. I, I would be I would be nervous about the response of that 102. I mean, it you know for that still that three link that rear suspension that whole deal. I, I don't know. I don't have enough information to really back up my opinion on the 102, but I know the 108 is pretty tunable. Um, there's a lot of information out there on a 108 car to get tech help. And, and, and so there's, there's a lot of positives in my, in my aspect, just from experience of people. Um, Larry, will you all be set up at the Chili Bowl again this year? Uh, we are not going to go to the Chili Bowl this year. We went last year. That's a very expensive event. They, they charge a lot of money for a booth there and, we kind of looked at it as possibly in every other year. Uh, we had a great time there, and it's a another indoor event that you got to go to. You got to experience it, and you got to got to see it. Uh, we're going to actually going to go back to Springfield, Illinois, to uh, Midwest 
the Midwest Speed Expo there for the, the Hoosier Tire Midwest guys. And uh, so we'll be in Springfield, Illinois at that show that weekend instead. And what weekend is that? That is the uh, 10th, January 10th. Must be the 14th? Must be, yeah. Yeah, yeah 14th. Well, the big thing we've been working on is our chassis schools. Um, we've uh, Our two-link schools sold out. Um, that is completely full, so that's exciting. We still have our four-link school, and, of course, you know, Chad will be there for the four-link school. Uh, ben Baker will be there. Um, Riley Hatfield from Eldora Speed Shop is going to be there. Uh, Riley is just, uh, you know, he... He's, he's a very strong wealth of knowledge. Um, he's had tremendous amount of experiences and been there, done that, and a lot of stuff. And he's raced USMTS, uh, he's, he raced IMCA, he's raced USRA. I mean, he's He's been a crew chief for I don't know how many people. And uh, so he's, he's a great wealth of knowledge. And then, of course, my son Bobby will be there talking about shocks and and so the four-link school is exciting. That's, uh, once again, February 3rd and 4th. We still have openings for that. Um, stock car school, uh, we got our IMCA national champion. Uh, he's going to be there to help us. Uh, uh, once again, you know, having a, a, my brain just went uh, – Having him there is going to be a big, big advantage. Of course, we've got uh, on the, uh, Paul Berger from b and Chastity. Uh, the uh, oh, there's another one that's supposed to be there for that, and I forgot to write that down. Bobby's of course going to be there with shock absorbers, uh, but uh, it's going to be Mike's. Mike's going to be a big advantage to have him there. He's, like I said, he's done, what is he, seven-time national champion, I think, in the, in the IMCA stock car world. So, I mean, that's that's pretty pretty good. So we're looking forward to that. That one is actually the uh, February 24th and 25th. Uh, it's a week after the Daytona 500. And... Uh, we still have spots available for that one. I know that one's filling up fairly quick. Uh, that's been pretty good. So that's kind of what we've been working on. Uh, what have you been working on, Chad? Well, we, uh, we've been debuting new products. We, we finally got our new carb covers. These are pretty awesome. So uh, longtime racer Keith Foss, my buddy, wanted to make a carb hat that was taller so you didn't have to screw the nut down so far oh yeah and then this is a actually a die cast heavy duty uh not a plastic or thin aluminum piece so and then it's got a it's got a square o-ring in it instead of a, a round one so it actually stays in the in the groove better so really cool piece and then a different one if you do have a different carb cover and don't want to buy a carb cover for half the price we got the troy shoot or todd shoot and troy came up with this uh, so this is a nut that's just clearance drilled. So this slides over the stud so you don't have to screw the nut down so far. Kind of, you know, two different ways to look at it when you got a short hat and a long, long nut or just by the tall hat. So a couple of new products there that we, uh, we got ready to rock and roll for next year. And What's uh, a carb hat sell for? That's 40 and then uh, the tall air cleaner nuts, 22.50. Awesome. Both are on the website ready to rock. So okay. this one's a this one's a silver, and then we'll have. Uh, I think they're bringing me blacks tomorrow, so we should have black and silver available in that. And then uh, these are five sixteenths or a quarter. Five sixteenths are black, and the quarters are blue. Hmm. And then we've also been trying to get that app done. That uh, we've been working on our our setup app. That I think I don't know when we started talking about that the first time. Bob probably almost two years ago we've been working on it uh and scotty i think scotty was a big influencer on the beginning of that trying to get an app together that uh you can do all your note taking and all your measurements and your maintenance and your parts list and 
you know, everything for your, your entire race team. So, uh, we, we have it pretty much done. We have uh, a bunch of testers that have it and, uh, we're pretty excited that this baby should be going live here in the next week or two. Bob, you got it. You've been playing with it. Yep. So it's, that thing's been pretty slick. yeah, so it's got a maintenance page, all your measurements, your parts list, race day notes, and a setup book and trackside tuning. So just a, a lot of information in there. It's really hard to do this on the thing, but like you just click when you with your trackside tuning and then you pick if you have a modified and you say loose, I'm loose in, and then it just kind of gives you a list of things that you would do. So just a, a wealth of knowledge in here and and uh, a ton of information that you can put into there and, and keep your whole race team in the palm of your hands, basically, is what, we, what we've come up with there, so. Well, I was very impressed with it. You know, I played with it. Uh, well, I've actually played with it quite a bit. And I played with it quite a bit on Sunday when I was watching some football games and, uh, you know, put all the information in there uh, for like a GRT car and in, in the setup. But so that, you know, when you go in there, after you have all that information in there, you just log in there. What's my right edge for the right front supposed to be, blah, blah, blah. And I was pretty impressed in it. Uh, I went into, uh, you know, where we talked about at the track where you ran hot laps and what, you know, what the conditions were. It changed springs and different things like that. And, and uh, like I said, it's uh, once a person has it and you, I mean, you could spend endless hours putting that information in there. But the problem is, with the, not a problem, the good advantage to that is, is, this is the time of the year when you've got endless amount of time. Like I said, I played with it for two hours during the Chiefs game the other day. And um, I thought it was amazing how much information I was able to input in just a couple hours. And if I was at the racetrack, boy, you know, a punch of the button, all that information would be right there. And, and the thing that I like about it from a chassis aspect of it, say, Joe, my customer out in Belleville, Kansas, or whatever, uh, he can call me and, and 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 he's got this information right there where I don't have to say, no, what about this and what about that? Well, I don't know. I have to look at our books or whatever. I mean, he'd have all this information there. So from a chassis manufacturer, I think it would be an outstanding deal having your customers on that information. And, and like I talked to you about, the parts list, just having the parts list with all the part numbers of everything that's on my race car, that in itself would be a, a, a big help. Yeah, a, a big help so that, you know, when I call order parts on Monday, I just put a shit in there and we can uh, set it up to the point where we've got all these parts on a, a spreadsheet to the point where if you've got a GRT car from us, you know, that information should be able to be input in there and you'd have all those partners. So I, I thought it was pretty cool. Yeah. Pretty excited. The maintenance side will log the laps. So you write down how many laps, you know, you, you got to change your engine oil or whatever. And then every time you go in there and do that, it logs that for you and it'll eventually send you an alert. Uh, once it calculates, as you put in the race notes night, how many laps you run, it'll bounce off your maintenance schedule. So just, a uh, there's a lot going on there. Like I said, we, we got everybody's input on this and we put it all in one big basket and it's kind of, kind of overkill and kind of badass at the same time. So, but there's, you know, you can use the portions of it that you want to use and the other portions, if you don't want to use it, you don't have to use it. So. Well, and I, just as an experiment, I typed in there, uh, repack rear wheel bearings, 500 laps. And then the next time I want to do it is another 500 laps. And then, yeah, it, it had that information in there, so I'm assuming it'll send me a note when after I log how many laps we ran, pack rear wheel bearings again. So I thought that's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty neat to see that come to a head. You know, there when we were working on it, that was uh, when we were putting some of the information together. It was um, well, I wonder how this is all going to work out, but uh, that's pretty cool. It's been a long time coming. Okay. Uh, let's see. 
Dan. Oh, buddy, Dan. Do you run the J-bar at zero on the Weir's quick change pinion bracket? Um, yes, we do. Uh, depends on what, you know, well, actually, we run it above zero. And you, I start out the, the evening with, and I have my standard setup, is usually a, an inch above zero on the quick change. Um, on a nine-inch Ford, it would be at zero. And that's the big difference is because the, the quick change, the pinion is an inch, the actual pinion is uh, an inch low, inch and a quarter lower than what the nine inch Ford is. So we always start with that and then work our way down from there, depending on, but not, not a lot down. We don't adjust it a huge amount. Um, Stefan's on a big half mile swooping turn track for a hobby stock type car do you think a left or 20 inch 125 would work or do you prefer to stick to the heavier 16 inch springs currently i have 16 inch and 13 inch split in the back just off season um i'll tell you what i don't like about the 20 inch spring of course there's a lot of height and then when you get a lot of height on a very soft spring, there's a lot of bow. And on a hobby stock and a stock car, there's nothing really to, to locate that spring so that it's in kind of a fixture like a slider on a modified or a, on, a, on a B mod. So you have a tendency to have a little bit of spring bow, which in turn, in time, is going to wear that spring out more. So I still stick with the, uh, I wouldn't be opposed to trying a 125 on a 16 inch spring with more preload in it uh, because you're taking that 16 inch spring and you're preloading it a little bit more. So it's not going to have quite as much bow. It, it's still going to have some bow. Anytime you have a soft spring that's tall, you're going to have a little bit of a bow issue, which is going to, you know, it's going to take the life out of that spring, but you can try it. I've, I've, we've got some customers that run the 20 inch spring and, and they like it. I know when we ran it on a modified, I didn't really care for it as much. And we had it, like I said, we had it in a, in a slider because it just, it, it, I, I felt that it had too much spring and bowed too much. What was your opinion, Chad? I think that's perfect. If you can't contain that spring, it's going to bow too much. It is. Um, Chris, is there an advantage to running a shorter rear end? Example, would be a 60 inch to a 58 and a half or a 59. And what would you recommend and why? Well, first, let me ask you what kind of car you're running is this a hobby stock a stock car or like a modified or a sport mod or something like that if it was a hobby stock we run a 59 inch rear end in our hobby stock rear ends because we want to try to tuck that right rear end and the, the rear end is it, it's it's like a standard 60 inch rear end on the left rear tube but it's a one inch shorter tube on the right rear bringing that right rear end more the hobby stocks, you don't have a, you know, the, the tire doesn't give you a lot of side bite. So you got to do what you can do to get the, ho the hobby stocks. The other divisions, we actually run a longer rear end and we'll actually run like an inch or a two inch longer on the left rear, getting the left rear out further so that it has more traction coming up off the corner. So in, in my opinion, um, you know, we've played with a lot of 61 inch spring rear ends on our, our, our modified and our uh, and our sport mod type stuff. Um, stock car stuff, you know, we, we've run you know 60 inch centered and we've run 62 inch centered. Uh, just getting but 62 inch, which is a plus two on the left rear, so. Kind of take that for what it's worth. He's a sport mod. Sport mod. Um, 
we're experimenting with some 61 inch stuff with this the beginning of the season standard is a 60 inch but we're we're using a, a one inch extension on the left rear i know there's some other chassis manufacturers that are doing that now and so we're going to give it a try and see how it works advantage engine offset to the right um you know we run the engine dead center in the car um and a crate motor is uh, it's like 13 inches above the floor to the center of the crankshaft um I, I like a balanced race car when you start offsetting stuff then you're wanting the race car to do something different at a certain point in time and i think you lose some of that balance what the advantages are of that i don't know if i could say moving it to the right definitely going to get the car on the right front more but i would be afraid it'd want to stay there longer also it's just like if you move weight physically move weight from right to left it wants to stay wherever you move it to it might make things happen faster at that point, but I think it wants to make it stay there longer. It's like if you move weight to the right rear, boy, it gives you excellent side bite, gives you great side bite getting into the corner, but I think it can hurt you coming off the corner. So it's all a balance. That's my opinion. Uh, Dylan, thanks, Chad, for all the products you build. Well, thank you for buying them. It's more about It's more about you guys than it is me. I can build any product I want. If you don't buy the product, there is no company. So thank you for, for supporting the American-made products. Um, Matthew, how to determine spacers on lower rod ends? What angle should rod ends be angled in or out? Bar toe. Rear toe. Go ahead, Chad. I'll actually let you have that one. So bar toe, when you're looking at the back, you always want the, the bars to toe in towards the center of the car. Uh, I'm not sure if you're a, a sport mod or a modified, but <clears throat> you generally the rule of thumb, the rule of thumb is... Uh, Free link USRAB mod. Uh, USRAB mod. So two inch on the left rear, is that what you do? Yeah, two inch on the left rear and one inch on the right, inch rear. On the right rear. Yeah. So two inches in and on the, the left rear and one inch in on the right rear. So that means the front's going to be pointed in if you're standing at the back looking at it. And a modified is a little bit less. The modified gets more motion in the four-lane car, so you want the left rear bars to be pretty much straight at ride height. And then the right rear, the bottom rod will be straight, and the right top rod will toe in. And the right bottom rod, the car kind of pivots over that right bottom rod, and it doesn't really do much. The right top rod gets a lot of movement, so that's got to be pointed in. Yeah, normally we point it in an inch. Inch, yeah. Um, but people, have, that's something that people have played with a lot. In, in one, the one thing about it, if you change it, you're also changing how the car steers because it's going to also tow differently, but it's also, once it tows differently, it's going to steer differently too. So keep that in mind uh, if you want to try some different offsets and see what they do. Is the app only modified specific or is there a metric stock car info on it? So right now, uh, the, the app is set up for the four main dirt classes, I guess you could say, the stock car, uh, modified, B-mod, and a late model. And the, really the only thing that changes is the chassis tuning. So when you're at the track doing the track side tuning, you know, some things you change in a four-lane car, obviously you don't change in a stock car. So we tried to base the tuning on it uh, to be class specific. And then also some of the measurements when you're setting up that chassis. So you can set up different chassis in there. The guys that have a modified and a stock car, they click the modified and then the measurements are kind of based on that car. So you'd have a four-link measurements and then when you click stock car it removes some of the different measurements that aren't necessary so like i said there's there's just so much information in there it's it's just crazy the amount of data you can put into there and keep track of so but there are the four main classes right now we've already had people asking for other classes and and uh the asphalt side also so this thing is just going to be a non-stop I bet this thing would be badass in the pavement world yeah it's this is just going to be a non-stop evolution of 
knowledge, I guess, you know, we're talking about Bluetooth and it's the smasher. And I mean, the, the, the things that we're working on right now and the technology side with the, the app and the ultra force machines. And, you know, it's, it's unbelievable. The, I got, my guys are pretty fired up my engineering team. And I feel we got some of the smartest guys in the world on our team and uh, just stay tuned. Our new ultra force machines are, are unbelievable excited about those too so a lot of cool so let's stuff let's take a little bit about them you what let's talk about those oh well i guess we might as well talk about it so the automatics are the uh, there's been a, a supply issue for uh over a year now getting touch screens and so we've we've kind of developed our own our own machine that is an automatic function uh so it's gonna be an automatic test uh do the graphing all the same stuff that we can do with our auto currently it'll be a little bit simpler to program uh, and the graph will read a little bit different it's going to read more like a shot graph our manual machines so we're going to build one machine that this is what i've been wanting to do for a long time like if you're a modified guy and you buy a manual machine i want it to to be able to upgrade in the future if you go lay model racing you just bring that machine back here we plug in a couple wires upgrade the software bada bing you got an auto so we're, we're heading towards building one touchscreen, one platform. The manual machines will have uh, the move to start capabilities and the unload springs. So, which is one of the most used things when you're using a spring machine, you know, when you're setting the load, you want to be able to go to 19 inches or whatever and set the load really fast instead of having to bump the switch constantly. And, and it just takes time to go back and forth. So all the manual machines will have that move to start and unload spring function and then you can store a corner. So you could have your left front, right front, right rear, left rear measurements stored in the manual machine also, and a pull bar measurement also. So if you're pulling pull bars, so, or if you're doing a, a fifth coil on a modified. So like I said, the I got the engineering team fired up and I told them what I wanted and they've actually come to fruition. And uh, we, we got to play with these machines the last couple of weeks here and they're, I'm excited, they're pretty cool. Cool. Um, Corey wants to know if multiple people can sign into the same app. Right now it's one, uh, that platform to have where you can have a login and have multiple people on the same app is, uh, it's the future. We, we, the developer used this simpler platform to develop the, the app. So that will be coming, but right now you're, you're only one person on there at a time. So. Okay. Can the setup info information be shared? Same thing. Can't, you know, that there's only one person in the app. So I think them, them kind of go hand in hand there. You're talking about having multiple people look at your team's setup information. And that's uh, one thing that will be coming down the road. Uh, when this app is available at the end of the week, how much is it going to cost? Uh, it's going to be a hundred bucks. I know several B mods with quick changes running the weirdest pinion mount at zero. I'm having trouble keeping the right rail out of the dirt and the left front on the ground. If I lower the J bar to zero on my quick change, won't this aggravate my problem? Yes, Dan, you're 100% right. Um, in, in my opinion, with some of the things that you're that Dan, that you've been talking about over the few weeks uh, and having the problem is, I'm not so sure that your rear end isn't too far to the to the left. Left. Um, it, it would, you know, that digging in the ground that that's still, you know, if, if the right rear sucked into the car too much, it's going to hook the car and then it's going to drive the right front in the ground, and it's going to make it. But if you were to move yours at zero, that would definitely make your problem worse. They, you know, take a look, you know, when you're walking through the pits and stuff, just kind of stop and, and and look at the rear alignment, how how some of these guys' rear wheels align in, with their front wheels. You'll find that um, a, a lot of guys, you know, the left, left sides tend to line up. And the right side you know, is probably in an inch, inch and a half. 
But on some lower horsepower stuff, that's where we, uh, I, a lot of times on a heavy racetrack or whatever, or if I'm having trouble like what, what you've had, Dan, uh, I'll actually put a half inch wheel spacer on that right rear. And as long as the car doesn't spin out, more than likely your driver's going to say it's going to feel a little bit loose, but he's got to get to the point where you got to run the car a little bit free getting in and rely on the throttle pedal to pull the car back up underneath it. And I know sometimes drivers, that's a scary thought, but if the car's hooked up right, you'll be able to run the car in free, get the car in, let it set, settle on the right rear, hammer the gas, and the car will throttle up, traction up, and go forward. Uh, Corey says, same account, I should have said. Yeah, I was about to have, yeah. We, um, we come. Dylan, stock car on the right rear too hard. Lower lead or something else, 225 pound spring. Um, well, I don't know if I would. You could lower it in a situation where, you know, you, you guys on the stock car can run a wheel spacers. Before I change a lot of lead, I would actually try putting a half inch spacer on that right rear. Uh, sticking that right rear out a little bit further. The problem is going to be is if you change the lead, then you got what you got. The, and if the racetrack goes slow and slick, you're going to want that lead up high so that it rolls over and gives you side bite. Because normally, a stock car historically has been short on side bite. Um, they, 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 they just, with the suspension that they have, they're not, a high side bike car and they're not uh, a tremendous amount of forward traction in, in, in those cars with that particular rear suspension. So I, I would play with, you know, wheel offsets or moving some, putting a wheel spacer on that right rear um, and, and see what that could do for you before I would go to changing all that lead. Plus changing all that lead, that's a lot. Bob's not a big fan of that a lot of work anymore. I've done that before. I'm years past that work thing, especially at the racetrack when you're scrambling. Now, I will have to say I, I, I recommend sometimes, but then I stand back and watch what happens. Uh, let's see. You know, my knuckles, you see this? All my knuckles are good. That means no wrenches slipped or nothing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, Chad, with the app, can you most same. know? Yeah, so that's the same question. Same question. Uh, what rear spring cups do you recommend for an IMCA stock car and why? Go ahead, Chad. I would run the, our OD grab stuff uh, just to keep the, the springs lined up better. I would probably, I would run a drop cup bearing on the right rear, unless you were going to run a three inch spring split, then I would probably run both drop bearing cups in the rear on the top um if you're not going to run a three inch spring split i would run the drop cup on the right rear and a standard cup on the left rear uh, but i'd run od grabs with the with the bearings in them as long as you stay in tension on that left rear which i think most of them are with you got a taller spring right yeah with the taller spring most of these guys and with the stockers especially they don't get as near as much movement as, as, uh, as like the sport mod does um, and they're a lot easier to keep contained yep. so I'd run a rigid cup on the bottom on the axle side and then the bearing cups on the top yeah and, and by IMCA rules you gotta run the rigid cup on the bottom uh, if, if it's an IMCA car USRA I'm quite sure you can do something different there what is the purpose of the split bird cage on the left rear like Nick Hoffman and some of the guys were running before UMP and Lucas Oil banned it? I wouldn't have a clue, so that one's all yours. Well, the, the split cage was uh, pretty unique. Won a lot of money with that there that one year. Uh, so what it was was it was two cages next door to each other. The four-link rods were on one housing 
and then the shock and spring were on another housing with an additional arm. So as you had a cage that controlled the, the four link rods, which was the wheelbase. And then when the car wheelbase, that extra arm would index into the, into the spring a lot. So it was at a downward angle. And when the car hiked up, that loaded the cage and it just made a, just a ton of traction. But unfortunately, the fun haters took that one away pretty quickly. We still got them if you want to bend the rules or if you don't have a tech department, we can certainly still build you that. Um, Cameron, keep up the great work. From my family to yours, happy holidays. I have some ideas on a tire machine info. I would like to call you after the holidays, Chad. Thank you again. Thank you, sir. Phones are always on. Uh, Tanner, Merry Christmas, guys. I got on late. What's the app called and what's and when will it be on the market? So the app is called uh, Circle Track App. It'll be on the, the stores here shortly, probably by the end of the week. Uh, we've been testing it for the last week and uh, should be ready to go by the end of the week. So be looking for that. We'll have a Facebook page for it and, and a website and all that stuff. So as soon as we're ready and comfortable with it, we'll let everybody know on the Weir's Machine side, social media, and uh, get her rolling. Uh, Tanner also would like to know, Chad, what you would recommend for spring cups on a 2020 MB custom B mod with soda. So I believe the the MB cars are running, I think, drop cup on both sides. Otherwise, I would run a drop cup on the right front and a top bearing cup on the on the on the left front. I think I'm I'm not a hundred percent sure if they're running both drops or not, but I know they were a few years ago. But if it was my opinion, I would put the drop cup in the right front and a standard top bearing cup in the left front. OD grabs with bearings. Uh, seen guys running very little angle on the pull bar. What's your thoughts about that? Um, once again, you take a little bit of angle out of that pull bar, you know, straight line traction, straight line traction. You, you're not hiking the car up as much. You're actually putting the force more directly to the tire rather than trying to lift it. Uh, it's, a, it's a different concept. Um, works in, from what I've, you know, I still run in that neighborhood of 10 degrees to 15 degrees. But from what I have uh been told that the guys that have run it uh, say that it's a little bit better traction. Uh, I know when they run it more level, they're running it a lot closer to the rear end housing, which is going to give you a lot more leverage, which is going to also also try to give the car more traction. Um, keep in mind, when you run angle on a pull bar, the deacceleration is a little bit of a disadvantage. So if you take some of that out of there, you know, it's not going to try to drive the car over on the right front quite so hard. And when you run that a little more level, that's going to still give you pretty good traction. But on the D cell, it's not going to drive the car on the right front so hard. Do either of you have tire pressure recommendations on the H500 Cruiser type street stock metric four link? Um, I wouldn't have any idea. Our normal tire pressures with uh, like the IMCA uh, Hoosier type tire, um, you know, with that, yeah, that's a stock, that's a cruiser deal. That's a, probably a stock, a stock tire. I have no idea. I mean, the, the stock tires, you got to be up in the 28 range. If it's an actual racing tire, um, you know, depending on which side you are, anywhere from 10 to 18 pounds. But I'm not that familiar with that particular tire. So, sorry, I can't help you out there. Uh, Taters wishing us Merry Christmas. I wish you guys a Merry Christmas. Um, I wish the weather wasn't going to be quite so merry. Um but 
I'm pretty fortunate. All my family lives relatively close, so I don't have too far to go. And that four-wheel drive Chevrolet can go through nine inches of snow and I only have to go three blocks. Now, ever since that time when I went in the, uh, Emily and I went in the ditch, I tell you what, man, the, when it snows, I'm just like, oh, oh. Or before, you know, I had one guy whizzing by me tonight when the road was pretty slick. And I thought to myself, hmm, that used to be Bob three years ago. Yay, hey, Bob, no more. And I had a truck from that right front dipped off and then it rains and then a trailer just, you can just feel it, just drive that thing into the ditch. I'm like, oh, man. But the best part was, did you ever hear the story about how we, we didn't have a shovel or nothing, so we emptied out some totes and we were trying to scoop snow with totes. Oh, oh my God. God. In a freaking snowstorm. Yeah. Yeah, that was a rough that was a rough trip home. That was a rough trip home. Yeah. You, you and Ben Ben drove up to Wisconsin, didn't he? Well then we parted ways and I just remember turning on I-94 thinking this is the dumbest thing I think I've ever done in my life, but somehow I made it home. Well, I stopped at four four exits to try and get a hotel room up on 53, and I there was no rooms. And I'm like, piss on it. I'm going to try it. And I turned on 94, and I was like, there's no way. But we made her limping. It was bad. Well, in the year before, when we were up in – where were we up in northern Minnesota? Uh, we drove home in a freaking blizzard. Dave Kane drove all the way to Minneapolis, and then I drove the, the rest of the way – and there was there was a couple three times where the old trailer and the truck were a little on the sideways side, and I'm thinking, oh man, yeah, yeah. That's oh, why we don't have that we don't have that second class anymore. Is that we why? don't have that class anymore? <laughs> I don't go to Wisconsin and I don't go to Northern Minnesota. Nope. What about what about Arizona? <laughs> uh, that that's a definite thought, you know, uh, that Idaho or wherever somewhere where it's definitely. But then did you know, when I was talking to, uh, what's his name from, uh, uh, the guy that wants us to do one out in Idaho? Oh, uh, chassis manufacturer. Oh, JR. JR, yeah. U when Utah. I talking to, when I was to Utah, I, I don't know, I knew it was out there somewhere. When I was talking to him, he says, well, I says, you got to fly in. I don't know where you fly in, but there's two hours of, of uh, two-lane road going from, I think it's from Salt Lake City oh, down to, and it's down this pass, and it depends on what the weather's like, whether you get through that pass or not. And I'm thinking, seriously, <laughs> now, I would want to fly south to do something like this? Hmm, maybe not. Anyway, hey, old buddies, running an Eldora stock car, rules worth, let's Rules were a three link with no bird cages or metric four link. Now, next year they've allowed four links with bird cages. Should I switch my three link to a three link with bird cages or should I switch to a four link with bird cages? My chassis does have the four link mounts on it. Uh, you know, if you've got the four link mounts on it and they're allowing you to run a four link setup, uh, there would be no doubt in my mind that's what I would do. I mean, the three link setup is definitely pretty smooth. I could see Eldora with the stock OEM suspension, the metric four link probably is pretty good. You know, that big old fast racetrack where you don't need tons of instant traction is probably not all that bad. But that four link is so tunable. Uh, you know, once you get it tuned and get everything adjusted like you want it to, it, it's, 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 you don't, people get scared of the four link because they go, oh my God, there's so much adjustment. I agree there is a lot of adjustment, but like I even talk about in the schools and I take and put duct tape over half the holes on all that stuff. I said, these holes are here because of all the different classes and different racetracks and different types of stuff that we have to do. And besides, if we didn't put all those holes in there, it would look too simple, and the customer wouldn't, you know, would would, would wouldn't be interested in it. So, in, in my opinion, the four link. You know, I'm not going to ramble on here. I, I would go with the four link mounts. I think 
there's so many advantages to that that it would be a, a good idea. Uh, Tater, right. Thank you, we in Montana yeah, helped us. Me and Sean Jackson set up our car last year. Very much appreciated, Bob. Thanks again. We got a blizzard and sheer cold coming our way, LOL. Well, Tater, at least I'm not feeling so so um, I don't know. I'm, uh, there for a while, I thought maybe we were the only ones who were going to get the snowstorm, so I was feeling kind of yucky. But now that I know everybody else is getting it, what the heck? That's where, you just, yeah, that's where you make sure you get plenty of diet Pepsi or Diet Coke and a couple bottles of rum and the snow <laughs> will get better. Uh, no doubt about it. Um, Chad, some of our extreme left rear drop, drop setups are loading the left rear spring bent bar to the point that it needs reinforced to maintain shape. Any plans on making a thicker wall or reinforcing the left lower bent bar rod? So I don't know, uh, David, if you have ours on or it, how long it's been since you got one of ours. We did increase the wall thickness uh, quite a bit to eliminate that problem. And as far as I know, I think the problem went away. Um, we don't have right now any plans of welding an extra beam across the, the bottom side of that. Uh, we wanted to try just going the easy way with making the wall thicker to see if that would live. And uh, uh, as far as I know, the late model guys that put the thicker ones on, the problems went away. So I think it should be okay on, on the late models on the modifieds. Uh, modified with the heavier axle probably would be a little bit harder on it than the late models, but uh, if you haven't got one in the last month or so, I, I'm not sure when they transitioned, uh, but we've been doing that for it a couple months ago. It's been a couple months. Yeah. So yeah, depending on super nationals, I thought, right. But depending on what size it was and when we ran oh, out of it, you know, it, wow. it's kind of one of them trickle down things that, uh, but they're, I'm pretty sure that everyone going out now is all sizes. So, uh, but I think that problem should be handled. Uh, Alex, have, have y'all ever thought about making Weir's trailing arm brackets on the chassis side of the GRT modified bolt-in brackets? Um, well, no, hadn't actually hadn't thought about that. We try to leave the chassis side to the chassis builder. As far as if he's talking about the double shear bolt in, is GRT a double shear? Yeah. Unless yeah. he's talking yeah. about a climber style, maybe. The climber deal doesn't work on a double shear chassis uh, bracket. We tried that years ago, and you have to, if you're going to do a climbing bracket, then you have to have a climber on both sides of it, and use two wrenches. And really not as cool as it, we thought it was going to be. Okay, so caught up. We're all caught up on questions. Uh, looks like we still have uh, about fifteen more minutes. Um, we had that trade show too. Some after the our last show, so we we did the Midwest Motorsports Expo after. Oh yeah, after I haven't actually talked to you since then. Yeah, so that was that was a pretty good deal. We had a, a pretty good turnout for that. We're, uh, we're excited to announce we're going to do it again. It's going to be a different time of year. Uh, so we're looking at about 14 months from now. So uh, February of 2024, and we're looking at doing that in Rochester again. So we had a good turnout. We're, we're trying to get about 20 more companies uh, that are just circle track stuff. So, I mean, I, I still feel, you know, I didn't go to PRI, and for the last month I've been getting beat up and, and torn apart and I just I just just don't feel like the the PRI show is heading the right direction for circle track racing and judging by all the the pictures and everything I've seen from Indianapolis a week ago it looks like I might be correct but we're trying to get a midwest circle track hardcore just what Saturday night guys need to see you know companies like us and 
and the spring manufacturers that you guys all use and we're we're about 20 companies away from really having a really solid one day show i feel and you know we're we're going to move it away from the we had it in november there and you're dealing with football and you're dealing with the end of the year races and you're dealing with hunting deer and all these things that really screwed it up and thanksgiving and so we're going to move it into end of february first part of march and uh, I guess we're probably going to have to talk about when you're going to do your stock car school because we were looking at that 24th weekend, but maybe we'll do it the first week of March after that school because you have that at the same time every year. But So we're really we're really looking to grow that show, and, and us and Kevco are working on that, and hopefully we can get about 20 more companies like us to get there for 2024 March. So, But it was well, a good know, turnout. I know Jeremy was pretty, pretty impressed. He, he was very pleased. His big thing was, he says, make sure if they, if we go back there that we get the same spot. Yeah. So his location, he was he was pretty adamant. That's the first first thing he said. Yeah, it was great, but if we go back there, make sure we get the same spot. I'm like, okay, I'll I'll talk to the powers and be about that. <laughs> Done. But yeah, he was he he seemed to be pretty pretty pleased with it. I mean, he thought that the traffic was pretty good. And uh, you know, like I said, he wherever he was, uh, he felt that he, they got he got really good traffic. You know, we we weren't prepared like I would like to be prepared for an event like that. But it's a deal where if, if we know we're going to do it again, you know, especially if we by having it in, in, in early March would be excellent. That would be per, or even late February. Because we'll, the stock car one, it just all depends on when the Daytona 500 is, because I try to have it the weekend after the Daytona 500. So whatever, whenever the 2024 Daytona 500 is, is when we'll have it that following weekend. Uh, Jeffrey, any ideas on how to keep from killing the, the left Killing a right rear spring on a sport mod deflection. You know, with the amount of steer that we've got these cars doing nowadays and the way the rules are to keep everything kind of fastened in there, the only thing that can give is the spring. And if you watch the video, it's amazing what that right rear spring goes through. So that's kind of what I tell my customers is, you know, springs are really not that expensive, especially when you compare it to how much you're going to get out of a tire. And that's one corner of the car that, in my opinion, on a sport mod car, every 20 nights, I'd change that right rear spring, no matter what it looked like, no matter what, I don't care. I'd change that spring. Just put a, keep a fresh spring put in, in, in that place because, I mean, I don't know the every I don't know what the actual springs cost nowadays. It's seventy five bucks, I suppose, something like that. And uh, you know, I, I like the higher end spring, you know, like Ibox uh, higher end spring. I, I like that for the fronts, but you know, people will kill me when I say, in my opinion, on a sport mod. I don't know if it's worth spending the extra money because it's going to wear out from bending just as bad as the standard spring will. So it's kind of up to the chassis guy. If that thing was in a in a containment like a slider, yeah, I definitely the, uh, the high end spring. I, I, I definitely would because see, it's not going to be flexing. It's going to just go up and down. So. Chad, I ordered five of your turkey carriers. Made my Christmas shopping much easier this year. Hopefully, they'll get put to good use next spring. Awesome. We love the game news. Can't wait till turkey season. We're working on hunting stuff, too. That's uh, The hunting has been a, a new passion of mine, reinstated, because my kids are are dialed into it, and now... Uh, you know, we made the turkey carrier, we made a game, a trail camera stick and, uh, we just, my buddy, Steve, uh, they carried a, a doe out by, with a stick, uh, a week ago. So we, we took 
the engine lift handles and we put it on a scores of rod. So now we have a deer drag. So, uh, we just keep, you know, doing these crossover, uh, trick parts to make the hunting industry trick too. So, so keep, uh, keep watching. We're, we're building some towers now for the, there's a guy that rents a corner of the lot here at headquarters and he sells hunting blinds and he came to us and wanted us to build a tower to put the boxes up in the air. So, uh, easy fab is, is, uh, working on cutting the pieces and we're going to be welding together some platforms to put the box blinds up in the air. So trick outdoors might end, might end up being a thing here. We're, we're keep getting these part numbers that get developed and, uh, you know, what's one more company? What the heck? More the merrier. <laughs> Just different spreadsheets to look at. That's all. Oh, I guess we got more things to build. There you go. There's a lot of stuff out there. If a guy actually just takes the time and look at it, I mean, it's just amazing how much stuff is out there. Now, you said you were going to be out in Pennsylvania in February? Well, that that isn't really announced, but yeah, I th we're looking at uh, Bernheisel's open house as the 20-whatever uh, the of, of uh, January. January, January. So we might uh, we might make a run out of it and go spend a day at Close and then a sp spend a day at Lethal. You know, Lethal just moved to, from Mooresville, North Carolina, to Pennsylvania, and then Bernheisel's had his his uh, open house for how many? Fifteen years he's been asking me to come to that, and I never I never have had been able to do it. So, you know, I just I got the sheet in the in the mail today, and I said, heck, why not make a Pennsylvania dealer tour? So. Looks like we might be doing that here the end of January, so hopefully we can make that happen and there ain't a blizzard. Yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah, or get stuck in Minneapolis on the way home. Uh, Rick, on a stock car, what do you recommend on putting new spring in and what brand? Well, you know... I'm going to sell you iBox because that's what we have on the shelf. Um, but as far as quality-wise, um, there's a lot of decent spring companies that do a good job. Hypercoil is a very good spring. Uh, like I said, you know, we kind of bought into the iBox and... Uh, um, Boy, my memory's not as good as it used to be. Um, the Gold Springs. Landrum. Landrum. Uh, we've got Landrum and, and Ibach on the shelf. Uh, I like both companies very well. Uh, they do a good job. Um, we don't have the other companies because I don't have the room to have any more springs. We actually... Um, added a spring rack in the, the showroom where we closed off that one front window now. So there's, we've tried to expand in our showroom. Our showroom isn't, uh, you know, we've got a lot of parts, but we sure could have a lot more. We just don't have the actual room to be able to stock more. And, and that's the reason we don't. The other question part of that was on a stock car, what do you recommend on putting new springs in? Well, the right front, no matter which car you have, I, I don't care what street stock, hobby stock, stock car, modified, the right front's going to be the one that's going to take the most abuse. And that spring, I don't care what the spring companies say as far as their how their warranty and all that stuff goes. I just know after a period of time, the spring doesn't work like it did when it was brand new. It can rate perfect, but where the people get screwed up on the spring deal is we rate these springs on compression. Where they go bad is on extension. And so now all of a sudden we've got this spring that compresses too easy. It still compresses at the same amount, but once it's compressed, it doesn't want to rebound as fast. So that's where the spring actually goes bad. And unless you've got a dyno like Chad's load machine that rates springs, 
on a graph on the pull and compression and rebound both, you don't know where that spring is actually at. And so, you know, these spring raters are, are great, but all they tell you is the compression side of it. And, and these springs don't go bad on compression. They go bad on rebound. Uh, Tater said, thanks, guys. Enjoy and watching and stay warm. Uh, how often do you change them? Uh, once again, on, on the springs, I'm, you know, left side spring, left front spring, I'd probably run 40 nights, half a season. The right front spring, I'd probably run a fourth of a season, or in other words, 20, 25 nights, same with the right rear. Left rear, if you're running those 125s or whatever, 15, 20 nights, uh, they just, uh, and, and like I said, what happens is they go bad on the, you know, we're expecting a 125-pound spring to do something that it was never intended to do. And so you can't expect it to last forever. And that old adage, you know, I mean, I, I had one of our guys that uh, was on my, uh, at one of my schools, and he made the statement, he says, well, I probably got 200 nights on your right rear. And I did everything that I possibly could to say, well, no wonder you suck. But, but I didn't say that. But I'm like, dude, 200 nights on a right rear spring? Holy heck, I'd have had four springs in there in that period of time. So, you know, once again, it, it just, the cost is, you know, Compared to a tire, man, it's just, it's just the suspension is such a key factor. And springs and shocks, springs tell it what to do. Shocks tell it when it's going to do it. And they just have to work together and be good. Uh, Salmon Valley said, happy holidays. Once again, well, we appreciate you guys. Make sure everybody have a happy Christmas and, and, or a Merry Christmas and a happy holiday. Uh, I was thinking about... Uh, What's your thoughts? Have you got something going on January 2nd, Chad? That's the day after New Year's. Uh, we're off that day, so no, I don't have anything going on. Well, we're off too, but if you if you wanted to, we could do January 2nd, and then we could actually get three shows. We could go every other week and get three shows in in, in January. Sure. You want to go back to every other week? I'm yeah, game. I think, yeah, we might as well. What the heck? I get too lonely. This is just, I don't have anybody to talk to, man. I hear the same things that I listen to every day, and it's like, man, I need to talk about something different here. <laughs> Sounds good. Bobby comes up the steps, and I'm thinking to myself, hmm, I wonder what this one's going to be about. Hmm. But anyway, well, we appreciate it. Everybody have a Merry Christmas and a Happy Holiday. You too, Chad. Yeah, Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. All right. Thanks. See you guys. Talk to you on uh, January 2nd.